So before release 15 of uh, Research Data Australia, which went live last April, default search would return research activities, um, services and parties, as well as uh, research data collections. There were already more than uh, 40,000 ARC and NH and MRC grants that were in the RDA system, so you would often find grants appearing uh, when you did searching. But now that the default search for RDA only returns data collections, we needed to have a separate discovery service for exploring research grants and projects. This is a pilot service because we didn't have enough resources at the time to do thorough user require, requirements analysis and design. Um, so we have a working service and, and we hope that you'll give us a lot of feedback and we'll do a, gather that feedback for an improved design next year. The ANS registry aggregates lists of research grant descriptions that have been provided by funders and it also aggregates lists of project descriptions which have been provided by research institutions and agencies. Currently we have 45,000 grant descriptions just from the two major funders, ARC and NH and MRC, and we also have 2,000 research project descriptions. The research project descriptions have been supplied as activity records um, in RIF-CS format by our data contributors. They may have been manually entered or they could have been harvested from contributor feeds, along with the way we harvest other objects like collections, parties and services. There's a good reason to have both grants and project descriptions. Uh, for the same study, as the information provided by the institution can be more current and may contain more information than the grant description which only has the information that was supplied during the submission process for the award. Also, there may be many research projects which are either internally funded or funded by bodies who don't supply grant information to ANS. So that's why we collect grant descriptions from funders and we collect project descriptions uh, from the institutions. So now I'm just going to have, give you a quick look um, at what the service looks like. Uh, you can see uh, from the main research data homepage, Research Data Australia, there's a Grants and Projects Explore service and on that you will see that your search is restricted only to grants and projects. There's also to browse um, by the same subject groupings that you will see on the homepage little bit of information about what the service is and also at the bottom there will be a link to all of the funders who supply grant information to us and if you follow those links at the bottom you'll get more information about uh, what they have supplied, uh, terms of use for the data, how current it is, uh, those sorts of um, items of information. A simple search uh, for, for example, protein interactions. Uh, notice also you can search within various fields instead of all of the fields, the same as you would um, on the home page. And there's also the possibility to sort the search results. Default is relevancy, there's alphabetic, but you can also sort by uh, the date that the project commenced or completed um, or by the funding amount for the grant. And you can see here if we look at, um, say we can filter the result to projects rather than grants, so those will be the ones supplied by the institutions. And you can see, for example, that first one has been supplied by the University of Adelaide and it's linked to a grant because they have used the grant identifier for their, their project description. Uh, if I go into there, you can see that this is the information that they supply. You can see the related data, the data that was output from that study. You can also switch and see the actual grant record, which is what was supplied by the Australian Research Council. But again, because they are linked, you can also, we are also able to see, if we go to the ARC, that the ARC's grants have funded this uh, creation of this data set. And returning to the search, you can see you can restrict to grants or projects, you can restrict by, filter by the status, you know, whether it's a finished or it's still active, the field of research subject categories, uh, the institution that's managing the project or the grant, um, who funded it. Within those funders, there are various funding schemes. You may want to restrict, for example, to studies uh, like discovery projects and exclude things like equipment grants. And also you can 
filter by um, the funding amount range, uh, the commencement date and completion date range. So that's enough. I don't want to go on any further because I have little time. So going back to my presentation, I'm going to anticipate this question about why do we bother. We are RDA as a service for discovering research data. It's what we're about. Uh, why do we bother with these um, descriptions of research activity? And that's because uh, project descriptions provide extra context for the published data sets. Um, the metadata about data sets may not be very complete and you may get more information when you read about the study. Also, the vast number of research projects that have been conducted um, over the past X number of years um, don't have published data sets, although many of them have produced data that could be uh, useful and reused in other contexts. So this is one way perhaps of discovering research that may have produced data that you could use, although the data itself has not been published. The grant identifier can pull together related data sets and publications. So by publishing grants and assigning a persistent and unique identifier, we have the ability for that to be used in the entire research sector to try and connect together various aspects such as publications and data sets and other outputs. Also, the funders of research uh, would like a way to see the research outputs that have been funded by their funding programs. And a side benefit um, is that before this, there was no one-stop shop for Australian research. And this could be useful nationally and also internationally because it could be added to global research discovery portals and people will become more aware of what research is going on in Australia. In this uh, climate of increasing collaboration, publications and data sets that result from the same grant could still be deposited in different systems. These together in a national or global service requires that they all use the same grant identifier. Now funders like the ARC and NH and MRC have always had their own identification system and grant IDs and they are the ones that have traditionally been used in the acknowledgement sections, for example, of journal articles. Uh, to identify the grant, but they don't resolve to any information about the grant. So the research sector needs a globally unique identifier, which is persistent over time and resolves to a description of the grant and supports linked data queries. And we chose the Perl identification system for this. Currently, the identifiers resolve to a view page in Research Data Australia, but as funders develop their own online systems, it is possible for us, for this research grant identifier to actually resolve to a view page in their system. And you can see that the way the grant identifier is formed um, is that always the funder acronym uh, comes before the grant ID. So for example, we can direct, redirect grant identifiers of this form to view pages um, in the ARC's online systems rather than our own. We also have a, a, an API, and why is that important? Um, there are many systems where access to research grant information is useful. For example, an institutional research portal may want to display all the research grants with which a, a researcher has been associated during their career or all of the research grants their institution has participated in, even though they may not be the administering organisation. An API allows these systems to interrogate RDA to display, display this information within their system so they don't have to come to RDA. Also, systems that support the submission and description of research data and publications could also use the API to provide lookup and validation for the grant so they don't have to have just a free text box where mistakes can be made. Additionally, analysis and reporting systems that want to analyse research funding patterns can also use this API as a source of information. There are two options for connecting data collections to research grants. If your institution supplies project descriptions to RDA with connections to uh, research data outputs, for example, then if the project description contains the associated grant identifier, then that's all that's required and the connection will be made. The other simpler option, if you don't supply those project descriptions, is just to add the grant identifier to the metadata about the data collection as one does for a publication. Of course, if the funder has not supplied grant information to RDA, uh, then there will be no Pearl Grant identifier. However, 
it would still be very beneficial to include the grant by just selecting the funder from a drop-down list uh, for Australian funders and then just add the grant ideas free text and, and also possibly a title and description. Uh, so this information is useful and perhaps later when the funder does supply us with grant information we'll be able to match the grant ID and connect it to a Pearl grant identifier. So you can see here in a system, say a research management system which manages all of the research projects in an institution, data collections may be connected to a project, but if the project has the grant identifier, we can also make a link between the grant and the data collection, which is very important for funders who want to see the outputs from their research grants. Just as an example of what happens in institutional systems, um, the following screenshot is from the University of South Australia's data management planning system. And you can see here they have a section for adding in uh, the funding source and they have a drop down to select the funder, funding scheme and the identifier. And if they use our API in this form, then this can be a drop down to select the scheme and this can be a, a, um, a lookup to um, type in either text or the ID for it to be validated and, make sh and return the actual Pearl Grant identifier. But at the moment, because they do put this funder number here, or sorry, the, the grant identifier here, just the NHMRC one, NHMRC one, when they're creating RIFCS for us to harvest into our system, they can turn that into a Pearl Grant identifier because they know who the funder is and the grant ID. Connecting a publication to a grant is already happening um, in most institutions. The Council of University Libraries has already developed guidelines in conjunction with the NH, MRC and ARC for tagging open access versions of publications resulting from grants with the Pearl Grant identifier. And as these research publications are harvested by Trove, ANS is able to harvest that connection from Trove so that we can include uh, publications as well as data co collections um, when viewing a grant in RDA. And there's a Trove guide which explains how to do this. Here's an example from the QUT institutional repository when submitting or uh, cataloguing uh, a publication, they can put in the funding body, which again comes from a drop-down list of funders, funders, and then type the grant ID and they plan also to use our API to provide a lookup for the grant ID as well, rather than have it as free text. Possibility of error. And just looking at some example grant views in uh, Research Data Australia, here's some ex uh, one from the NH and MRC with researchers that's linked to a party record. You can see the pearl. There are also uh, other examples where you will see related data collections and ones where you will see related publications. But unfortunately, I've lost the link, so and I'm running out of time, so I won't demonstrate them here. But those links that are in the slides, if you follow them, you will see those records. So we're only at the beginning stages um, of building this service in terms of the content. Currently, the um, the grant metadata that's provided by the ARC and NH and MRC includes investigator names but no identifiers. If this was provided, for example, of an ORCID or an LLA party identifier, the grant could be linked to information about the research that's been provided by their institution and to all of their grants and outputs, um, no matter who the funder was. And also, the grant data they provide doesn't include um, institutional partners in the grant, only the single administering institution. So we are continuing our engagement with them to hopefully get more information in the future. And we're at the start of a process to expand uh, the registry to include grants from other funders. For example, we're currently working with the Department of Environment for them to supply information um, about their research projects, uh, sorry, the research projects they fund, for example, in the National Environmental Science Program. And they will require the resulting data from those um, research grants to be published and also to be linked to their grants um, by the institutions who deposit the data. In that way, they will be able to see in RDA the outputs from the work that they fund. Most data collection descriptions 
do not contain the related grant identifiers at the moment. Most research project descriptions that we have in our system do not contain the Pearl grant identifier. Uh, and this is where we want to make some progress over the coming years. There's limited coverage in RDA of research grants from funders other than ARC and NHMRC currently, and again, we hope this changes. And there's limited coverage in RDA of research projects, past and present, that's been undertaken at Australian research institutions. We only have a very small number of them at the moment, and usually those are ones where the data has been published. So. Our message is, from this presentation um, and our continuing message is that research institutions can now provide us with descriptions of all of their research projects and we would like them to supply as much as possible. More funders will be supplying grant information to RDA. Institutional systems can have a look up widget for the quick selection and verification of grants and inclusion of the Pearl grant identifier rather than just free text input. And we would like as many people as possible to give us feedback on how we can improve this service. Uh, there's a list of references um, that I've added to the slides which will be made available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hello everyone from Canberra where it's just started snowing. Um, I'm going to talk about two identifiers that you can include in your metadata. One is a unique identifier for a person or organisation who worked on the research. And the other is the grant identifier, which nominates who the funding agency was and the specific grant number in a consistent way. So I'll start with the party identifier. Many organisations have some type of record set that describes people associated with them. So it might be the research staff at a university, authors of collection items in a library, members of a parliament, actors in a theatre company, and so on. A few years ago, the National Library and ANS worked together to set up the People and Organisation Zone in Trove. Our goal here was to bring together those records from different organisations and systems and to make them discoverable in a single place. We especially wanted to bring together records where the same person had different records at different institutions. And we wanted a consistent way to identify that person across those different systems. So how does it work? Well, the first time we get a record describing a new person, like this one for Marcia Langton, we set them up a record in Trove, which is like a container. It acts like a big bucket. The next time we get another record describing Marcia Langton from a different source, we put it in the same Trove Marcia Langton container. We work with about 40 sources now, and each source usually has a snapshot of the person's life and work as it relates to their own organisation. So for this Marcia Langton example, we've got four sources that have a record describing her and all have a different piece of information to bring together. Uh, Libraries Australia has an authority record that knows different forms of her name and the titles that she's published under. The Australian Women's Register has keywords that describe her fields of activity as an academic and an activist, and they've also written a biography about her achievements as a feminist and a land rights advocate and an actor. On her ORCID profile, she named the universities where she studied and been employed, so that's the organisations that she's related to. And then IATSIS, the Australian Women's Register and ORCID all know publications that she's authored. They're not the same ones, but all those pieces of information come together to form a more complete picture about her life and her work than any single source does. It's a great benefit to a user who comes along and finds this record in Trove. And there are also some clever infrastructure benefits that come along with this service. So this Trove container record is the amalgam of records from four different organisations. IATSIS, the Australian Women's Register, Libraries Australia and ORCID. In the background, we keep all of their local system numbers. So you can ask us for IATSIS record A22464 and Trove will return this big container record for Marcia Langton. They all resolve to this overarching persistent identifier and we call that the NLA party identifier. It always has the form nla.gov.au slash nla.party dash and their unique number. So Marcia Langton's is this one with 615464 on the end. Now all records in the people zone group identifiers for that person into a single container. So if a university has records for their researchers, they can add them to Trove 
Trove will put it into the bucket for that person and then they can ask for their own record back and they'll get all the other related identifiers that Trove knows are associated with that person. The party identifier is persistent so the URL will always resolve even if the system changes. It can be used by anyone to refer to Marcy Langton. That's background on how Trove aggregates records for a person. This then goes on to play an important role in how RDA can identify researchers. So here's a re record for a researcher named Kim Anderson. It was established by the University of Adelaide. And then later, Kim set up an orchid for herself and a Libraries Australia Authority record was also created. Trove brings all three of those records together into this one container. So now Kim has a persistent party identifier in Trove. Over at RDA, she's added a number of data sets like this one. And she's also associated with a research project. Its research project description in RDA, as well as the data set and the Trove party record, all include that same NLA party identifier in the metadata. Because they all include the NLA party identifier, systems like RDA can automatically bring together all the different bits of data from different contributors and different local systems and build a picture of Kim's current research, which is just what RDA does. Now, if Kim were to move to a new institution and get a new local identifier in their system, it doesn't matter. As long as she uses her NLA party identifier, then services like RDA and Trove are able to tell that it's the same Kim Anderson that previously worked at the University of Adelaide. When the NLA party identifier is used, we can collect together all the research someone has done no matter where they've done it or what system it's identified in. A similar situation exists with the funding and Monica already touched on this a little bit. So hopefully you know about that guide that Call released last year that lets us know how to tag repository records with ARC and NHMRC grant numbers so that we all add them in the same format to repository records for publications and for research. The format is the permanent URL, which currently resolves to RDA, Hopefully everyone's seen this before, but if they haven't, it's a standard prefix, the funder, then the grant number. So in my example here, I've got an ARC funded project, LX0881890. If a user goes to that URL, they're taken to the page in RDA where they get the overview of the project. In Trove, if you search for the same grant number in the same Perl format, you'll find 18 publications that are associated with that same grant. Now those publications aren't all held by the same institutions, um, they're held by different repositories, but they've all put the grant number in the same format. So the first one is the UQ Institutional Repository, the second one is the University of Wollongong, and because they've both used the same format of the grant number, they both came back in my search. So just for a quick look, here's what the record from the University of Wollongong looks like in Trove. You can see the ARC grant number, it's in the right format, it's on the record. We're also now getting those grant numbers in the same format added to the records in the people zone and researchers are actually doing this for themselves. So when a person includes that they've worked on a particular project, particular grant number, we use that information to further broaden the picture of their research without them needing to do any more. So the first author on this paper is someone called Sara Dolnika. She has one of those container records in Trove. And on the record we got from Orchid about her, she included that she'd worked on a number of ARC funded research projects, including this one that I've circled. She included the grant number in the correct format. It's the same grant number that we saw in RDA and the same grant number that's been tagged in those 18 publications in Trove. Now Sarah doesn't have to include the 18 publications in her record here that describes her as a person, Trove can simply use that standard format identifier to link through to all the publications tagged with the grant number. So clicking that returns a user to those 18 articles. Trove didn't actually do anything, it just relied on the same grant number given to us in Sarah's record from Orchid and the repository records. Most important thing is that a user doesn't have to know how all this metadata works. They don't even necessarily have to understand what a grant is. From her biography, they can simply click through and discover more information that they didn't know they wanted. So wrapping up, what are the benefits of including these identifiers? Well, including a persistent identifier for a person allows systems like RDA and Trove to identify different bits of research, different data sets, publications, bring them together and relate them to their creator. It also allows the link to go back the other way, to link creators to the research they've participated in. Including a research grant number allows us to do similar things for funding grants. 
to identify the project, bring together the people who worked on it, the data sets and publications that were outputs. When researchers move institutions, it becomes easier to discover and import their previous work. And for end users who are discovering this information, they can expand their search without having to understand how the system works. Now all of that relies on consistently using the same format of identifier across institutions. When we all use the same format, then these automated, automated systems can do a great job of bringing together research outputs from a single project and across a researcher's career. I might leave it there and hand it back to you, Susanna. So yeah, I work in, at Griffith University in eResearch Services and a while ago we used the ANS Research Grant API to improve the data that we present in the Griffith University Research Hub. So the Research Hub is our publicly facing researcher profile system and we build that for two main purposes. One to make Griffith Research more discoverable to show what we're doing and uh, the other one to give researchers a profile that they can use for their own purposes that you know they can share that shows their work individually. And um, to give a bit of background, uh, the Research Hub is built using Vivo, which is a semantic web application, and it's uh, becoming quite popular. There's there's a large number of universities worldwide that uh, build their researcher profile systems based on this. It came from Cornell University originally, so there's there's a huge uptake in the U.S. in particular. And um, as a semantic web application, it has a couple of very nice benefits for this sort of purpose and uh, one is that it provides a very rich ontology to model information about researchers, research related activities, organizations such as institutes, schools, groups and in terms of activities we can model publications, grants and other research output. And of course it's also easy to add third party or your own ontologies to uh, add even more data to this. Now, when we developed the research hub, one of the main aspects that we wanted to cover was that uh, people would not have to maintain their profiles themselves. And so, in that spirit, we try to get as much data as possible from various enterprise systems at Griffith and external systems if available. And um, so, at the end, at the moment, researchers really only have to add their photo if they want one, a short bio statement, and maybe a research statement. And everything else, including academic degrees, employment history, publications, grants, supervision and so on gets drawn from enterprise systems and we get the same information about institutes, groups and schools. However, one problem that we came across was that enterprise systems were at some point built for a specific purpose and that was usually not that the data would be displayed publicly. And for a lot of the data that's not a huge issue, publication records are fairly standardized so we didn't have any problems there. But Grant information in particular was not very well covered in our systems. Sometimes just because we weren't the managing organization, so if things changed later on in terms of titles and um, amounts and whatnot, that wasn't necessarily reflected in our systems. And um, the other reason is that we didn't necessarily need descriptions and whatnot for the reporting purposes the systems were built for. So for the research, we identified two business cases where we could use external grant data and uh, really add some value um, to the research hub. And um, one was to improve data on existing grants, get better descriptions, get full funding amounts like uh, the, the total grant amount and not just the share that Griffith University um, got from it. And um, the other business case was that while we knew about grants that had some affiliation with Griffith, we didn't know anything about grants that researchers had while they were not at Griffith University. And so adding that information became quite important because while it doesn't showcase any Griffith research, it is an important part in the biography of our researchers and um, it gives a much more complete picture, especially because we do have historic information about publications and whatnot, so not having the grants left a gap that, that many people were sort of eager to close. And again, we didn't want people to enter this information manually, so getting as much of that done automatically as possible was the end goal. And this is where the ANS Research Grant API came in. And yeah, as I said in the previous talks, it draws from the same data sources as the uh, Research Data Australia portal. And so it has very comprehensive information, especially about ASC and NHMRC grants. And um, it also provides us with a very nicely cleaned up version of this grant information. So information that is 
maybe not well captured in in a standardized vocabulary in the in the source data was actually cleaned up and is now provided in a very nice form. And the API is based on Solar, which is a very simple to use, very nice and very well documented uh, enterprise search engine. And so using this data was actually quite easy for us. So for the first business case, we didn't actually have to do very much. We could basically look up grants based on their grant ID and the funding body. Grant IDs aren't necessarily unique across funding bodies, but um, doing this lookup was quite easy. And so we would get back the record as a, a JSON formatted uh, record. And all we really had to do was map those fields to our RDF vocabulary and do a few related lookups for um, people in our database and whatnot to, to link it up properly. But all in all, it was a very, a very easy process. And um, well, we did this work quite a while ago, so about a year and a half, I think, most of it, or a bit longer. And um, initially, a lot of the text fields still contained a lot of the actual information in terms of funding amounts and whatnot, and we did a fair bit of text processing to extract it as well. Nowadays, um, ANS has done a lot of work on improving this, and so we're now getting a much cleaner version of the data. So whoever wants to get into this um, area now and use this information is uh, in a really good position to get very nice and clean data from this. The second business case was a lot more difficult. So um, we just heard about research identifiers. It's still very difficult to get that information for our researchers at the moment. And ORCID is not very common yet. And we don't get ORCID identifiers from the API or from the funding bodies. So what we had to do to get historic grants for researchers that had nothing to do with Griffith was we had to come up with a way of matching researchers by name. And for that, we built a two-stage scoring function. One simply looked at name similarity and gave us some idea whether two names could be referring to the same person. And we put a lot of empirical work into that because sometimes people go by a preferred name, sometimes by the actual first name. Some people always include their middle name. Some people don't. So. There's a lot of work to do about that. And then we still have the problem or had the problem that names are not unique. And so we added a second score that was based on the fields of research people um, published in. And we have very good information about that in the research hub. So we could build a portfolio of four codes that um, people had published in previously. And we just went by the assumption that if they had a grant in the past that had a certain four code, that they would have at least one publication that had that four code as well. Yeah, then we had to implement some additional handling for edge cases where grants were actually managed by Griffith that we had information about them, but people were different institutions and still attached to them and linking all that up. But um, that was all relatively easy once we had the linking up uh, and running. Well, I can't actually give any numbers about how well we are doing. Empirically, it worked quite well. and. Um, in practice, over the last one and a half years, I think we had about two or three false positives where people um, informed us that uh, the data was incorrect. And we built in functionality to uh, manually add and remove grants, but still automatically ingest the data. And yeah, so both of these cases were very successful. And that was largely thanks to how easy the ANS API was um, for us to access and to use. And um, yeah, I thought to wrap it up, I quickly put up some links to the systems involved. The first one is our research hub. The second one, for those who are interested and who may not know about it already, that's the Vivo project, which is definitely worth a look for everyone who's interested in um, getting into the space of researcher profile systems. And the last one is the documentation to the ANS API. And as it's since it's based on Solar, there's a lot of additional resources everywhere on the web. And uh, yeah, that's all from me.